Morning everybody, how are we all this morning? Are we well? The sun is shining down here in Dorset, what's not to like about that? My name is Ali Board, Alison C. Board, and this is Technique Tuesday. Now, it might be your first time joining us today. If it is, fantastic, you are very welcome. I'm sure there are lots of people in the room who have tuned in, certainly over the last year, where I've been broadcasting live. But here in the UK, yes, Yesterday, restrictions got lifted a little bit, and so I'm hoping very much that you're all out there enjoying a little bit of shopping, but managing to stay safe and seeing your family at the same time. However it is that you are tuning in today, whether you are watching live on Facebook or you're watching via catch up on my blog or YouTube, of course, as usual, you are all welcome. Now, because this does go out live, I do like to say hello to you in the chat. Otherwise, it's just me talking madly to a little green dot on my screen. Um, it's lovely to know that you're the other end. So uh, give us a virtual wave, say hello, let us know what you're working on, talk to each other. That's much more important than talking to me. Talk to each other in the chat, be supportive to each other. But I'm gonna give just a little bit of a shout out to those people who have tuned in live, if you don't mind, because I like to say hello, I like to hear what you're up to, and it's very kind of you uh, to take the time to tune in. So who have we got? Pam Forster gets the uh, award of the day for being the first one to comment. Well done, Pam. Uh, Kareen, Anne, uh, Tony, Lynn, Julie, Ruth, Steph, Pen, Andrea, Lynn, good morning to all of you. Janice, Joe, Jilly, ooh, all the J's in a row. Um, Anita, the very talented Anita Pounder is in the room. Thank you, lovely, for taking the time to join in. Jeanette, you are right. It is a very stunning morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, Lynn, uh, Thyra is in Sweden. Good morning to you. I should learn what the Swedish is for good morning, but I'd probably just embarrass myself if I'm honest. Uh, Joe's in the house. Uh, Joy, Rosie is in France. Kathy, good morning to you. Linda, Jane, um, Janet, who is thanking me for a little bit of advice that I gave her. You're very welcome, Janet. Uh, Diane, uh, Jan, Linda, D. Good morning, lovely. Uh, Christine, um, who else we got? Oh, they zip by so fast. Uh, Rosemary, good morning. Uh, Martina, good morning morning to you over the water. Jane and Ali D. Uh, Chris. <laughs> Chris is saying, just back from the vet, living the dream. Yeah, I had to do that yesterday. One of my chooks is poorly and she's been giving me the right run around. She's fine. Um, my chickens are, are poorly at any given moment. Uh, B, good morning. Maureen, if I haven't said good morning to you. Ah, the lovely Susan is in the room. Long time no see, my lovely. Are you all right? Um, if your good morning uh, happens to pass me by, Please don't think I am snubbing you. It's just they, they come in a bit thick and fast. And uh, I need to look at you there and uh, not down there. So uh, my apologies if uh, I miss it at all. Looks like we have quite the Dorset contingent today. You are very welcome. Right, shall we talk about this project? This is part four of our amazing landscape project. So let's show you the photograph that we have been working from because I'm fairly sure the photographer's in the room as well. Morning Lynn, morning Joe, morning Geraldine, uh, morning Brenda. So this is the photograph that we have been working from, um, taken by the fabulous Catherine who has let us use it. This is part of the Camino de Santiago. This is looking towards the Pyrenees and it's been quite the challenge, hasn't it? We've been uh, talking about mist, we've been talking about aerial perspective, all sorts of things. And so uh, this, I'm, I'm hoping this is the last part today. I'm not entirely sure, because you know me, I'm never sure. It sort of depends on what questions come in. It depends on how far I get with it. We might need to do a little bit of tweaking next week. Who knows? We are going with the flow because that's uh, what we do on Technique Tuesday. Shall we take you to the overhead camera so that uh, you can see how far we've got? Incidentally, if you are thinking, what's she talking about? Part four of the landscape. I haven't seen parts one, two and three. Very easy to find. In this broadcast, if you are watching either on YouTube or Facebook, there is a link to my blog. Click on it. 
it'll take you over to the blog and then you just need to scroll back through the timeline or you can put it into the search bar just at the top of the blog post and you'll be able to see all of the other parts to it so you can start from scratch it's entirely up to you right here it is all ready and good to go so we've drawn it out we've talked about composition we uh, talked about layering colors on we did some color mixing tests in previous broadcasts uh, we uh, layered a few things on last week we did quite a lot didn't we we kind of uh, we put the sky in we put some of those uh, aerial perspective um, Pyrenees in a kind of a recession that's the word I'm looking for to go back and we started to think about the greens now what we're going to do uh, this week is we're going to put these fields in and we're going to deal with this great big swathe of stuff going on in the foreground and then I'm hoping that we will have time to start working on the extreme dark to look back at some of these hedge lines and to get that little building in and all of those kind of things but if we don't get there it's fine we'll do it next week uh who's popped up that i haven't said good morning to uh, mick our resident poet the lovely mick is in the room good morning uh here are the colors that i have been using so just to give you a quick recap let's uh i try to put them in color order but it doesn't always work so we have the raw sienna light we have Cobalt Violet Deep. There's been quite a lot of discussion over on the Learning to Paint with Alison Seaboard Facebook page about that Cobalt Violet. Don't know if you saw it. Lots of people saying how Cobalt Violet varies. If you go back to when we first started talking about colour, I did suggest to you that this is the Cobalt Violet Deep. This is the Daniel Smith one. But actually, I have to say, in the experiments that some of you have done, they've all worked really beautifully, haven't they? Uh, so raw sienna light, uh, cobalt violet deep, cobalt blue, morning Alison, uh, green appetite genuine and James Grey. Now these are all Daniel Smith colours. That is just a coincidence, okay? You know, a lot of you know that I do favour Daniel Smith watercolours, but that doesn't mean that your landscape paintings won't be successful if you use another brand. Of course it doesn't matter. And interpret it as you see fit. I have seen uh, a few comments uh, go up this morning how people aren't even doing this landscape. They've kind of got their own photograph and they're applying some of the techniques that I have discussed on a piece of their own. So... All I'm saying is you interpret it as you see fit, make it your own, just enjoy the process, don't worry about the finished painting, okay? I've got two brushes here, these are my favourites as you probably know by now, these are the SAA Imitation Sable Brushes, all of the uh, water and paint holding properties of a traditional sable without the financial or ecological concerns. Now, the first thing I have to do, which is more important than anything, is to get the glasses on. Otherwise, I'm not gonna be able to see what's in front of me. So I have to um, perch them on the end of my nose because I need to see your comments coming in at the same time. So I'm adopting the position and uh, I also need the photograph up in front of me so that I can see what I'm doing as well. Uh, you see Ruth is saying that uh, she's using the white knight colours and Lynn is saying that she'd like the job that names the paints. Yes, I'd quite like that as well. I've always been uh, on, on my kind of career bucket list. I've always wanted a paint named after me, which is terribly egotistical, but it would have to be violet, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> just have to be right I've got the photo up in front of me now so the thing that I am going to tackle is I want to tackle these kind of green fields that are coming in what I don't want to do is to do this field and then work on this hedge line and then this field and then work on this hedge line and then this and work it up like that because um, I'm concerned that it will look a little bit too patchwork like and that isn't what this landscape is about. This landscape is about the atmosphere of the mist and this kind of strong light, all of those kind of things. So we're going to tackle uh, stuff all at once. So I've got my number 10 brush. What I haven't got is my uh, security blanket. Need that in my hand, don't I? 
And the colours that I'm going to be using uh, for this are the Green Appetite Genuine, which we introduced a little bit of up here, didn't we? And some of the James Grey. Uh, good morning, Rachel. Never late. Please don't ever apologise. And greetings to you too. Now, we need this hill here to have a very strong uh, silhouette because we need it to come forward. It's not the misty murkiness that's going on in that valley. We need it to have a strong hard line, but we don't necessarily want to have it as a bright colour. So if I take my, uh, I'm going to have to pick it up because I can't work like that. If I take my Green Appetite Genuine and I put it down uh, very neat on my piece of paper, I think that's going to be too much in the foreground. So I'm going to incorporate a little bit of the James Grey in that too. Now there's two ways that you can do this, of course. Morning, Linda P. Um, you could take some of your colour, pop it into your palette add your James Grey to it or whatever it is you're using, your translucent grey, whatever it happens to be. You could mix those together like that and get a rather passable colour or you can stick to the method that we used for the hills where we loaded up with one colour and then we dropped another one over the top. It's entirely up to you. What I think I am going to do to give myself a little bit of a safety net is I'm going to pop a little bit of water over here on the right hand side so that it gives me a bit of time to get that line in and that it will blend out over on that side so that tiny little bit of water is sometimes useful now let's load up with a bit of that green appetite genuine and a bit of the james gray on the brush too good morning carol and then up here we can let's use the tip of our brush to start to introduce it and then what we can do is to use more of the brush coming down straight back into the water. You can see you've got a lovely bit of James Gray uh, going on there. And we can use some of that water to blend out the colour. Now it needs to go into the tree line because we want to have um, some nice shapes coming out of those of that hedge line, don't we? So it could even go across if you wanted to. The other thing you can most definitely do with it, if you want a tiny bit of texture, is you can, of course, take a little bit of kitchen roll and roll off the excess, if that's what works for you. But there we've got our nice strong green coming in. We've got to put that uh, little bit of hedge line in yet, but that's working okay. Don't forget, it's going to dry back a little bit darker. And also, one of the things that I think some of you have uh, messaged me about, I have put a photograph of where my painting, uh, it, this sort of stage that my painting is at over on the blog. And a lot of you have said, oh blimey, it looks a lot different in the photograph. To get a broadcast out to you, I have to light myself up like a Christmas tree so that I don't look like I am, look at me, look at me faffing up there. You thought, uh, <laughs> I thought I'd get away with that. Um, uh, so that I don't look like I'm in the dark. So it always looks brighter in the broadcast than it does when I photograph it. Now let's turn it at an angle a little bit because I'm right-handed and I want to deal with uh, this part of what's going on in the valley um, and I, I struggle to work across myself last like that it feels really awkward so let's turn it a bit of an angle and let's repeat the process. So we've got a hedge line coming in I'm looking at my photo I'm trying to decide what to do and then we don't have to worry so much about this end of the field because it's cut off by that amazing dark fuzzing out into um, the trees that are in the mist over there. So don't need to worry so much about that end. I do need to worry about this end. Okay, got it straight in my head. I do this a lot. And what happens is uh, it's like a sort of rehearsal. Uh, perhaps it's my theatre upbringing, I don't know where I go, and then I do it, okay, rather than just sort of blindly stabbing at it. So let's repeat that process. Bit of uh, Green Appetite Genuine, little bit of the James Grey, turn it on its side, let's have a look back at that photograph, nice light touch, don't go at it crazy style. Then I can put all of my brush down, back into the water, moisture off onto the kitchen roll, pulling that colour down and around into that tree line and trying so very hard to not faff about with it. 
but uh, I think I'm just going to push that colour a little bit further along. That's better. No, that's better. And uh, then when we come back to it, yeah, that works all right. That's okay. That's not bad. Maybe a bit of reg rolling. Mm -mm, maybe. Yeah, that'll do. Okay, leave it alone, Ali. So we've got that one that's in, that one that's in. I uh, can't wait to get those trees in. Really can't wait to get those trees in. What I need to work on now is this great big bit of stuff going on in the foreground. Now, we talked about this right at the start, didn't we? And there was much discussion about, was this a maize field? Was it sunflowers? Could you put poppies in? All of that kind of stuff. Now, you interpret it as you see fit. What I am going to suggest to you is have a think about where your focal point is. What's a focal point? A focal point is where you want your eye to disappear to or where you want the viewer of your painting's eye to disappear to, to give a sense of depth. We are looking at a great distance. The whole point of this amazing photograph is that this bit is very far away, this bit is very close to. Now, what happens in paintings, and I see this a lot, is people get to the foreground and they put way too much detail in on this. So your eye drops down the page and you're looking at what's going on down here rather than looking across and out to where that sunshine is hitting on the hills. So <laughs> Pam's just said, Ali Nofaf is in the house. Yeah, she <laughs> she's always lurking there, Pam. Um, so I don't want to put a lot of detail into this foreground because if I do, all the attention is going to be down here and I don't want it down here. I want it to be in this region somewhere, okay? So that's something to be mindful of. I know it's tempting to start counting ears of corn down on here, but that's not where you want your focal point to be. For this painting, other compositions may be slightly different. I want it to be over here somewhere. If we were doing a uh, different composition where we were very low down in the field and you could only just see some of those mountains poking through your ears of corn, then of course you would put lots of detail in the foreground because it isn't about what's going on over here. It would be about the texture in your ears of corn. I hope that makes sense and I hope that helps in some way. Um, if not, do feel free to rewind me <laughs> and have another listen. Somebody needs to. So let's go full pelt, green appetite genuine with a bit of that raw sienna light picked up in my hand, ready to go. <laughs> yes, Anne, other compositions may vary. Other compositions are available. So <laughs> you're all in fine form today. Do you think it's, if, you, if you're in the UK, do you think it's the sort of euphoria about being uh, let out a little bit? We've kind of gone a bit crazy in our house. Uh, good morning, Barbara. Right, uh, let's go nuts with this raw sienna light and let's get some of this colour in. So I'm pushing really hard, pushing my brush really hard into that pan of colour so that I pick up a lot. Don't be scared of the colour, otherwise it will get the better of you. You need to tell it who's boss and wrestle it to the ground. So let's stick this in. Let's put some of that colour in. Let's add a little bit of water to the brush so that we get that lovely sweep of yellow coming down. And it's wallop straight away in the foreground. Do I need to over-describe the edges? Of course I don't need to over-describe the edges. What's the point of painting that all in when you can suggest lots of other stuff? Ah, lovely Jean is in the room as well with her fantastic husband, Terry. Jean and Terry, I miss seeing you, but hopefully later in the year we will resolve that. So uh, let's blend that colour out a little bit and then let's get into this green appetite genuine. Now this colour, when it is neat and used on its own, is incredible. Why is it incredible? Because Daniel Smith know what they are doing with their pigments. The finest pigments known to womankind are used. And so what happens is you get strength, you get luminosity, and you get it doing some exciting things on the page. Uh, morning, Trisha. So we've got this coming in. We can use just the tip of our brush 
to sweep some of that color into the yellow so you get it kind of going up the hill like that um, and I'm going to allow the brush to skip over the surface because like I said don't need to be over describing it try to uh, make the lines that you have radiating into that yellow you see there I've stopped them all at the same place that's rubbish composition so let's do something about that and get them creeping up the hill a little bit. Let's take some of the moisture off and taper that out a bit, that's better. And then back into here, because it's all really damp at the moment, so I'm kind of getting away with this. I can strengthen that color even more, pulling it out into long lines, and then hopefully that gives the kind of illusion of the depth of color, the strength of color, all of those kind of things. Now, I'm still not happy with this line. If I put the kitchen roll into this now, I can't then touch it with a brush because I'll have altered the uh, moisture content of the paper and anything that I add back in will be wetter. So uh, I need to be mindful of the fact that if I'm going to alter the end of that line or I'm going to put any kind of marks into this with my kitchen roll, my work is then done as far as the foreground is concerned. And do you know what? Do you know what? I'm quite happy with that. I like the shape that I've got out of it. I like the sweep that I've got out of it. And I like that whilst I have got texture and it is suggesting that this is foreground, what I haven't done is detract from those colours that are going on in the distance. Uh, what's Rosie put? The Chinese have a lovely expression when the brush skips over the paper. They call it flying white. Rosie, that's amazing. I've never heard that. How fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Righty-ho. Now, there's nothing else I can do to this until this is dry. Why can't I do anything until it's dry? Because if I now start putting these uh, hedge lines in, they're going to bleed into that colour and it's going to make it kind of mushy. That's the technical term for it, obviously. Um, and uh, I want uh, some crisp lines coming out. Uh, Rachel is saying that she's got it on a bigger screen now <laughs> and it looks better. Yeah, I don't look good small, Rach. Uh, right, heat gun on, waft the air at it gently to start with, and then you can go in and dry it off properly. Bear with me, two ticks. So moving that heat around over the surface, it's actually quite warm in the studio this morning, so it's drying quite quickly anyway. And we'll get that colour shifting around. Not forgetting, of course, one of the reasons we have left our piece of paper free and clear is so that we can dry the back. There we go. And then get it. So, I mean, the test for how dry is my paper is always to stick your finger up in it. And is saying, sorry, she's got to go now. She's got to go help somebody called Mike, <laughs> who I'm hoping she knows, uh, move bricks. Absolutely. Catch up later, of course. Ruth, that's very kind of you. Thank you very much. So we're moving the colour, sticking your finger back in it when you're fairly sure it's dry. It still feels a bit damp to me. Yes, Linda B, of course I have a purple heat gun, which is ancient now. It's got to be about 20 years old, this thing. I'm waiting for it to give up the ghost because I'm not very nice to it, if I'm honest. <laughs> Anne is saying that she got waylaid by her window cleaner and how inconsiderate of him when Technique Tuesday is on. <laughs> love it love it love it love it Chris is, Christine is in the room lovely Christine late to the party never all the best guests come late to the party Jean is saying she's got to go and kettle bell I love it people dipping in and dipping out of the room it's awesome okay that's getting there bit of an extra turn up of the heat on the back and then because it is a cotton paper it needs a bit of reshaping so we do this to it you'll see uh, watercolor artists do this a lot if they leave their paper um, free from the background uh, yes Martina I <laughs> I've got TV to do later in the week for which I need my heat gun as well I don't want to be jinxing it do I uh, so not too bad at all whilst that cools down as well I do tend to pin it down with my hands 
Um, oh, right. Okay. So uh, this is actually the colour hasn't shifted too much on this. A real testament to the quality of the paper and the paints has to be said. And now we get to do a small amount of tweaking. This is not faffing, you understand. Tweaking is where you go back and you make small alterations for the greater good of your painting. Faffing is where you push it around for no reason at all. Uh, righty ho. So what do I want to use? Uh, what combinations do I want for my mid distance? I think I'm going to use a slightly paler green on there. Uh, coming down here. So you can see this is the rehearsal again, isn't it? This is the, the me going, I'll do that and that and that. Uh, we'll do that one, a slightly paler green, that one in a paler green. And then over here, where they start to disappear in the mist. In fact, let me show you the photo again so that you know what I am talking about. Uh, over in the mist, they kind of, they go back to that bluey tinge again. So I need to make absolutely sure that I uh, think about those trees in the mist before I happily paint away in my green and my grey. So I've got pale green over here, a little bit of cobalt blue, I reckon, coming in, or maybe a little bit of Jane's grey. We'll see how we go to fuzz them out into the mist and then they can get stronger in the foreground, can't they? Uh, let's do it. Let's stop talking about it and let's do it. Um, what I am going to do as well is I'm going to give my, where can I put those where they won't be in the way? I'm going to give myself the option of being able to turn my painting 90 degrees. Why am I doing that? Because I want to paint this hedge line up to that line that I've created in the field in front. Now this is a really awkward aspect to be painting at. So much easier if you go back in and work it that way. This is a number six brush. So we'll uh, make sure that that's nice and wet. I have to say, I do put my brushes in the water two or three times. I hadn't realized I was doing that until I analyzed it the other day. To make sure that they're clean, to make sure that they are really kind of well wetted, that type of stuff. No, Ruth, no moon glow today, who knew? And then over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to load up my brush with the Green Appetite Genuine, just on its own to start with. Let's have a quick look as to where I'm heading. So it's this one. Now, here we go. I'm going to absolutely control the amount of paint that is on my brush by rolling it into the kitchen roll. Just enough so that it doesn't run away with me when I start painting in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint a kind of baseline to some of these bushes, turn it round the right way, and then I'm going to go back in and using just the tip of my brush, I'm going to dot some of this back in. So we're moving it around on the surface. All we're trying to do, I'm not looking, I'm not trying to replicate the shapes in the photograph because that way madness lies. All I'm trying to do is to get that sense of hedge in. Wash the brush out. Again, control the amount of water on the brush itself. And then I can work back into those, spread out some of that colour. You can even go back in with your kitchen roll if you want to lift some of it. And what that should do is give you that kind of sense of where those bushes are. It would be so tempting, wouldn't it, to start counting them, to get really kind of bogged down by them. But we don't want to do that, do we, lovely people? No, Ali, of course we don't. Um, lots of people um, have just uh, uh, tuned in. Very lovely to have you here. Now, what's that... Uh, what weight of paper did you use just placing order to the SAA? SAA will be thrilled. Uh, this is um, 300 gram, 140 pound Saunders Waterford, not surface, and it's in the extra white, the high white version pen. Uh, let's have a look at it again over there. So again, paint, um, brush in the paint. Oh, I'm losing my mind today. Uh, putting in that baseline. You can see how lightly I'm touching the paper because occasionally I skip over it. I'm add a little bit more water to the brush this time. We've got a larger bit of hedgerow here and working that back in. Now, whilst that's still wet, I'm going to go into my Raw Sienna Light 2 to pull out a little bit of sunlight. Moving that backwards. Where's that going? That's going over here. 
pop that in into the water blend it out um rolled out onto my kitchen roll and then moved across the surface again not over describing it not trying to fill it all in in fact could actually do with something a little bit darker in there too maybe so you get that nice variegation going on pulling that across and there's another I, I penciled it oh, penciled in another hedgy bushy thing here hedgy bushy thing that's botanically accurate isn't it Rachel be crying <laughs> um, but I'm not entirely convinced that I want that there so all I'm going to do actually I'm going to pick some of this color up off my palette because it's a sort of nothingness so I'm going to put that in to to give it a sort of nod but to not over describe it there we go that will do uh, probably needs a little bit of addressing I think uh, I'm gonna leave that as it is I'm in grave danger of overdoing it if I'm not careful now this one in the foreground uh, Janet has just asked a question <laughs> clumps of trees that's what it is uh, only just tuned in why did you go around the head shapes with the background green when you're painting the hedges in a much darker green wouldn't it be simpler to do the first wash overall yes it would Janet but if I do that I didn't actually go around them I kind of put a little bit of color into them the danger with going over them is you get far too used to taking all the white away and actually what I've got there as well is got I've got little bits of white watercolor paper poking through if you get into the habit of coating and layering and doing that you can knock the white away if you're not careful uh mick is saying mick has written a fantastic poem i love to faff on a sunny day to waste my time just idling away but when painting it's not so good to do because if ali finds out she'll be chasing you mick <laughs> I need that on a t-shirt. Right, let's get this foreground one done. Um, I'm going to swap my brush out because it's a funny thing about brushes. Sometimes I think I have used this one for something that I shouldn't have done. So I'm going to swap it for, what have I got going on over here? Here's another one, which is covered in paint. Look at that. I tend to have three or four brushes in the same size, which I know is very decadent but I am horrible to my brushes. These are a good three or four years old now, and you know, I'm amazed that they've stood up to me being so horrible. That one feels better. Righty-ho, uh, green appetite. Let's get that brush loaded up. Let's do the, the same thing. I've got a hair sticking out there. Uh, let's get that dark line in negatively so that we throw that field forward now we can afford to put a little bit of extra detail in here can't we because it's closer to us why am I starting with the one in the middle I'm starting with the one in the middle because I want to fuzz this end out and it's much easier to go from strong to fuzz than it is from fuzz to strong <laughs> there we go there's another adage for you and uh, then I can exactly ascertain how fuzzy this needs to be by putting the strong one in first. You might do it in a different order. It's fine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So there you go. Who was it? Oh, I've got brain like a sieve. Janet was um, asking about uh, why I didn't coat the colour all over. There you go. You've got a bit of that white hedge poking through just there. That's what I quite like. I quite like it when my paper shines through. I need to get a little bit of a shuffle on because my paint is drying because it's so warm in the studio. Uh, over here, we've got a much gappier tree. Oh, I'm all, all about the uh, botanical discussion, me, aren't I? A gappy tree, a tree that you can see through a little bit more. So I will make smaller marks for that. Uh, Trisha has just said, uh, what's your demo of the mixed media demon of the bald eagle? <laughs> Absolutely fabulous. Yes, SAA were very kind on social media yesterday. They shared my uh, bald eagle demonstration that I did for them, which was combining watercolour and oil paint, which was uh, quite the challenge, but I did love it. Quite like that painting. Need to hunt that painting out again, Tricia. Uh, yes, I, I realise that you meant demo. Don't, <laughs> don't worry. Uh, that's uh, predictive text for you, isn't it? The, the thing that uh, we fall foul of so often. So there's that tree that's a little bit closer. And then over here, you've got some other concerns going on, but I'm gonna deal with those last. What I want to do is to deal with the fuzzy ones. Uh, 
So a lot more water on the brush, less paint, so that the water has a chance to um, reduce the consistency of it a little bit. You could, of course, do it on your palette. I prefer to do it this way because I know that this is a procrastination tool. So I'm going to start making this fuzzier, paler. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of the James Gray, just a little bit. I'm sort of tickling it out of the pan, maybe a little bit more of a, of a tickle. And I'm going to add some of that back in where it's kind of wet into wet so that we get a, a grayer version of it. And I'm going to start adding a bit more water, smushing this out across the surface. And then I'm going to go to my blue, my cobalt blue, and I'm going to add that back into the trees as well. So you get that sense of the weather taking it over. You can see I'm moving my paper. This is another reason why I leave my paper free and clear of the board because I like to move it around and it becomes too cumbersome to move the drawing board all the time. So there, hopefully you can see those trees disappearing out into the mist. They're probably a little bit strong and probably the pencil will do the job fine. That's better. Fuzzed out. And <laughs> Steph, could you start writing my dictionary for me? That would be great because I do come out with some corkers. Smushing. Yes. <laughs> word of the day so what I'm hoping is that you can see that uh, fading out what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of that and I'm going to take you to close-up camera so that you can see that in a bit of detail so there's the yellow and there just above it is that tree line there we go if we go over to the right you can see the green appetite with the James Gray being mixed in and then if I go back over to the left again, you can see where I've just faded it out enough so that it reads without over describing it. Now, move my photograph. <clears throat> um, yes, uh, Tricia, that uh, bald eagle was um, on Facebook. It was on Instagram. And of course, you can if you are an SAA member, you can log in and you can watch the whole demonstration from start to finish. I'm sure if you put bald eagle into their search engine, you will find it. Really pleased with that now. I was worried that I wasn't going to be able to get that mist going on. But actually, I, it's OK. I, I'm good with that. We've, I'm glad I put that shadow in last week down there at the bottom, but it is fading out. So we've only got uh, one more bit to do, haven't we? We need to get this uh, bit of foliage in and we need to get the building in. And then I think we're done. So it looks like we are going to finish it this session. Uh, let's reset. So over on this side, I've got my Green Appetite Genuine. Do I want it to be stronger? Yeah, I think I do. Just uh, a lot smaller. So we'll put that dark line in, set the scene, a few little nods to foliage. So let's get those in. Tiny amounts of colour now. Tiny amounts of colour. Not trying to overplay it at all. Um, the one thing I am very mindful of at the moment is that I'm trying not to make regular marks. I'm painting something that's natural. If I put my, um, interpret it with my hu human regular brush marks, it's not going to look great. It's not going to look like it has occurred naturally. So I'm trying to dot the colour around. I'm trying to vary where I've put it. Not to make uh, kind of triangle shapes or squares or anything that makes it look man-made. Right. Let's get up close and personal to this building. So to do that... I'm going to, I wonder if this would be better if you saw it in close-up cam, actually. Dooby dooby doo. Let's get close-up camera in and let's get it trained on the bit that I'm painting so that you can see it. So what I'm doing is I am working the foliage around the man-made shapes in the landscape. So this is uh, requires you to be not talking, probably. <laughs> um, and so I'm putting the green around and then I'm dotting that foliage over the top. It needs to be dark 
in order for our subject to come forward. So you have to be brave with the depth of colour. Of course, you can still vary it. Of course, you can leave the white of the paper showing through, but it needs to be this kind of depth to get it to work. Um, I'm hoping against hope that you can uh, see that. <laughs> Mick is saying he's got an appreciation for anything bald. Oh, Mick, you do make me chuckle. Uh, right, let's get my photograph back again so that I can see what I'm doing. Now, uh, we've got a sort of... Uh, I thought that was a chimney, but actually I think that's foliage. So let's cover that up over here. And then we're kind of working towards the end of our painting, aren't we? So I'm loading my brush up with colour. And then going back in, we've got um, a bit of foliage that kind of comes in front of that building. So let's get that in and making sure that we get right up and close to these kind of rectangular shapes and yeah that, I mean there's all sorts of things that you can do to to vary your shapes you don't have to follow the photograph to the letter in fact the only reason I would probably follow the photograph to the letter is if this was a commission and the person who was commissioning me owned this house and therefore I would need to be paying lots of attention to the fact that that house needed to look definitely like it is so I'm hoping that that kind of little close-up shot helps to see the minutiae of detail that is required to get that in nice and neatly. Let's go back to the normal overhead cam so that you can see it uh, starting to come together now. And let's move that over there. Uh, yes, Steph, I, th I think that's the thing that I don't necessarily uh, verbalise as much as I should in that uh, I do have a light touch. We talk about this a lot in my classes, about the amount of pressure that you actually use on the brush as to whether you're just using the tip or using all of it. Now, what did I do there? I stuck a little bit of the James Gray on my brush because I want this to fuzz out on the right hand side into a sort of nothing. I don't want this to be the focal point and so I'm gonna blend out those shapes so that this part of it is there and it is dominant, but it's not overpowering. Now to finish that off, that isn't finished yet. I haven't put the um, windows in. I need to dry it because I can't leave that as white or as flat as it looks because it doesn't look uh, three dimensional, it looks two dimensional. So let's give it a dry. Make sure that anything that we add to the building isn't going to run into any of the foliage because that wouldn't be good, would it? So let's get that in. That's probably enough. Yeah, that's all right. Give it a bit of a wrestle. Make sure that it lays down flat again. And oh, do you know what? I think I need a smaller brush. Who knew that was a thing? You should use diddy brushes. What size is this? A size four. Okay, it's not too diddy. It's not like a, a zero or a one or anything frightening like that. Um, Jane's Grey. Now, this is an argument for using a palette in that you might want to be absolutely sure about the depth of the colour that you're going to use for the shadows. Don't forget, you've got your test strips. So you can always put some on there. And if you're thinking, oh, that's a bit dark, then use your water to manipulate it that way. Uh, now, what do I need to put in? I need to uh, give this a nod with a little bit of shadow because it's too white. A few marks, done, jobs are good. Uh, we need to put a shadow under the eaves of whatever this building is. Put that there. And I need to, to make this less white as well. So I'm going to dot a few little shadows on there. But I do need to make those windows dark. Otherwise, it's going to look peculiar. Now, this is going to be the bit where I can't talk and paint at the same time because it's far too finickety a thing. And the danger is that if I talk, see, slowed down already. <laughs> if I talk and paint at the same time, it will all go to pot. Right, let's have a look at this. What's going on here? So we've got that one and we've got that kind of longer window going in that way. A little bit of water to blend that out. You can still do blending out in a really small space. 
let's make sure our perspective isn't too dodgy and then it has to be said i wasn't gonna do this but uh, oh no i am gonna do it because it's just a nice way of finishing off i am gonna do some spattering i am gonna do it uh, because i can really and uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to do a little bit of it in cobalt violet so let's load up that number six brush with the cobalt violet as you can see this is one of the reasons my brushes give up the ghost because i smash them around um and i'm going to add a few little dots of spatter down in the foreground and up near where my buildings are got a bit of wet into wet going on there quite like that and coming down uh we've got some so we've got a bit of texture uh going on down here and okay a bit went in the sky that's what kitchen roll is for and maybe the odd nod to spatter over on that side there so for me that is pretty much finished what i am going to do and uh, particularly as uh, steph has requested it is i am going to use that close-up cam to show a little bit more of the detail so let's get that involved so we've got the hills going on. My apologies if you can hear my dogs going bananas in the background. I think we've just had a delivery. There's that hill line coming on down. We've got that lovely mist in the background. That's working uh, very well. I'm very pleased with that. I'm going to turn this at a slight angle. Let's just put that. There we go. Then you can see it properly. Uh, so up in the top left hand corner, you've got that very strong blue, you've got the hills, you've got the mist, you've got that little nod to that hill covered um, uh, coming up out of the mist. You've got, look how deep that green is in the appetite genuine. And then you've got it coming down here. Look at those bits of white paper showing through both in the foreground and behind the tree. Very important. Got the yellow poking up behind that. There's those buildings with their shadows and their windows. And uh, there you can see that little bit of spatter. And uh, yeah, Martina said a signature spatter. I think it is. I don't know why. I just like to kind of, perhaps it's what we call a ta-da moment. Do you know what a ta-da moment is? We go, da da at the end. But one thing I am most definitely going to do is down here in the bottom left hand corner it requires a signature now i wanted to talk to you about this about signing your work if you are going to turn it into a greeting card or a print or any of those kind of things then don't sign it don't sign it photograph it scan it do whatever it is that you have to do to it first a reproduced signature in my opinion doesn't look great okay it doesn't look um i hate using the word it doesn't look professional but to me you want to be looking at the picture the signature is for the original that is the whole point of it i don't like personally seeing a signature in a reproduced piece of work if you want to sign a reproduction sign it actually when you get your prints coming through or sign your card or whatever it is but if you're going to turn this into a product of some description don't sign it before you photographed it and edited it but i'm not going to do that with this this is an original i'm not going to do anything with this um other than uh, possibly send it to ireland and um so down in the bottom left hand corner is where i'm going to sign it now lots of discussions to be had about signatures some people like to do a tiny little signature some people like to hide their signature along a contour so that it isn't a big feature of it traditionally in an oil painting it was always the last color that you used which was very often red um, but that's a 200 year old technique that i'm not sure stands anymore I particularly like to sign my work in pencil and there are lots of reasons like why I do this. One is that I don't have to worry about pencil fading. Uh, this pencil is not going to fade, it's going to stay the colour that it is. I like the fact that I've used pencil and you can see my pencil lines all the way through it so signing it uh, in pencil seems to be very fitting. I don't like signing things in something that's too dark um, but also, I'm not going to make any excuses for the fact that I painted this picture. So I do like a big signature and I know that's not very popular, but that's just how I do it. So down here, 
in uh, the bottom left hand corner conveniently left in my composition it's almost like I knew it I will sign it and there we have the completed piece so I hope that that slow process from start to finish is useful I hope that that has been something that you can turn into your own paintings now don't disappear on me don't let those viewing numbers go down I can see you I'm kidding um because I have some things to tell you um this I will the uh, the blog post is already up bar the video which we are recording now and uh, a photograph of the final piece I will go over and I will do those in a second but I have two things to share with you three things to share with you can't count one is that if you are an SAA member on Thursday morning at 10 30 UK time I will be doing a new demonstration a tiger portrait in gouache and pastel pencil I filmed it a couple of days ago and it will go out as if it's alive I will be there in the chat um, we've been doing it this way with the SAA because it's um it's quite a nice thing for me to do to sit in the chat and answer your questions or talk to you all that kind of stuff I really quite like it so I've been filming my demonstrations and then they get put uh, they put them out live and I sit there in the chat and we can uh, talk about what it is that I'm doing and I can expand on anything if I haven't made myself particularly clear then on Friday uh, UK time 7 a.m and 11 a.m I'm back on the television now the channel used to be called Hashanda it's now called the craft store you can get it now let me remember this freeview channel 85 sky channel 673 freesat channel 817 or of course you can watch it online they broadcast live on their website so that's the craftstore.com but if you can't remember the craft store use the old hashanda name h o c h a n d a and it will navigate you that way as well i have got new products to show you uh, gouache is going to feature again acrylic i'm painting in acrylic uh, and my book my black watercolor pad all those kind of things that you are used to seeing on the 26th of April all of my July to December classes go live on my website so that's online sessions in-person sessions evening classes the all aboard artists all of those kind of things so if you've liked what you've seen while you've been watching Technique Tuesday I would love to have you in a more one-to-one -one session don't forget at any point, you are very welcome to email me, downendfarmstudio.com. I'm just a little bit slow with my emails at the moment, simply because I have quite a high quantity of work coming in. And then at the end of the week, obviously, I've got SAA, I've got Hashanda, I've got the craft store. And then I'm taking the weekend off, if I'm honest. Uh, but please don't fear, I will be back with a new Technique Tuesday next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Same time, same place. Who knows what I will be painting then? I haven't decided yet. So if you've got any suggestions, let me know. And I will be very happy, just as Catherine did, to turn a photograph into a demonstration for you. Until I see you next time then, where no matter where it is you pop up or where it is that we meet, Please take lots of care of yourself and we will see each other very soon. Bye, lovely people.